Morning, church. Good morning, everyone on Zoom. Well, what a wet and wild day. Cold outside. But here we are in the warmth of God. A God who nourishes us, looks after us, cares about us. And he always has done, and he always will do. Now in the days of Charles Spurgeon, this is a man who for 30 years preached every week to a congregation of over 6,000 people. And we talked about sermons last week, well Richard did. And Spurgeon said, to avoid being too long, a man has to prepare well. And if he's prepared well, he will preach for 40 minutes max. If he's not prepared well, he will need 55 minutes. And if he's absolutely nothing to say, he will need more than an hour to say it. And when advising his students how to shorten the sermons, he says, study them better, spend more time in study than in the pulpit. And it's true because study is so relevant to us today. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. One of those preachers from years ago, they were building his hall, it was a massive place, and he wanted to test the acoustics. And he raised his voice and he shouted, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And right there and then, one of the workers fell to his knees and gave his life to God. And that's a true story. But it also bears out what Paul said. Come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. The word has power. It has power. In Acts, 3,000 were added. And in verse 3, in Acts 2, in verse 3 it tells us, and then fear came upon them. But then we go to the great revival, Spurgeon, Wesley, Finney, all of them, the great Welsh revivals. Smith Wigglesworth and others, they had massive regular congregations. People flock to their services. Because as in Acts, they were a God-fearing people. God-fearing means a reverent feeling towards God and living in a way that is considered spiritually and morally correct. They gathered because they didn't have the distractions we had, have today. All this technology we have today that yes does good, but the devil will twist it to do harm. There is no fear of God in the world of the flesh today. And in some Christians. It's gone. They worship all sorts of other things. We look at Luke 12, where the rich man had a bumper crop. What did he say? I shall tear down my barns and I shall build new ones to accommodate his crop. But the most damning words were, I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many gods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. Until God said to him, Fool, I require you tonight. We never know when he will require us. And that brings me to Revelation 5. I know you're not, there's, it's kind of like a massive gap there, but well, let me read it. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll 
written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I look, and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came back and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the twenty-four living creatures, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. Some churches shy away from Revelation. Some Christians think it's heavy and scary. And because of that way of thinking, in a lot of places it is neither preached nor is it read. Revelation is prophecy. Revelation is not something that's separate, not something that is of a distant time. We are living in it now. Of course, it's fearful and frightening. to those who don't believe in God, those who don't trust in God. But all those fearful, frightening things are outweighed by the blessings, the beauty, the light and the love of our great God. Of course it is a book that needs careful study and teaching. But what does it tell us right at the beginning in verse 3 chapter 1? Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. Right there a blessing. And by not reading or preaching it, people and churches throw this blessing back into God's face. And then they wonder why things are not going well in their lives. Things will not go well without God's grace, mercy and blessings in our lives. So John says, I saw in the right hand, this is the hand of God, the hand of righteousness. And in his hand is the last great design of God. He's ready and he's resolved for the final act for his church. And that includes us. We are included. God kept this to himself until the moment of his choosing. Yes, we have scriptures and prophecies, but this was his secret design. This is not something he would like to see happen. It is something that will happen. His power and his majesty will ensure that his will be done. We as a church need to be more focused on the power and awesomeness of God as well as the will of God what do we say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy will be done not our will his will the Father's will there we have a strong angel proclaiming in a loud voice there's no weak angels but this was an especially strong angel. He was a champion. He was mighty. And it was a challenge. This proclamation he shouted was a challenge. 
he shouts to all can hear even Satan himself was cowering under his rock at that moment of proclamation this is the question isn't it what did the angel shout who is worthy this is our question my question are we worthy the scripture teaches us that we must be worthy of Jesus and, his, Jesus and his calling us. And Jesus also tells us in Revelation, Revelation 3, 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. But in Matthew 10, 37, he says, he who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me these are the words of Jesus not a disciple not an apostle these are his words his instructions to us Paul teaches us in Thessalon 2 Thessalonians 1 Therefore we always pray for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling And in Ephesians 4 1 Therefore a prisoner of the Lord Beseech to walk worthy of the call of which you were called I read over 20 passages about being worthy church it's expected of us it is necessary it is necessary in our Christian lives we heard last week how Jesus commended the centurion in Luke 7 what did the centurion say Lord do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy not worthy that you should enter under my roof and Jesus says in verse 9 I say to you I have not found such great faith not even in Israel and it goes on we have the wedding feast and in Matthew 22 8 it says in the words of Jesus the wedding is ready but those who were invited were not worthy they would rather go to their farms or attend to their businesses the wedding feast of the Lamb is growing ever closer and we are invited but are we worthy and I ask myself that all the time am I worthy and in many ways I fall short I think especially knowing the price that was paid for my sins John Piper <clears throat> made a good summation of this and, and he said we do not merit or deserve or earn the Lord and his calling and his kingdom we don't we don't deserve how do we deserve we're an undeserving people we really are but in our need God grants us to see them as infinitely precious infinitely worthy and we embrace them with desperate desire oh church how in our darkest hour have we embraced God I did crying out broken weak worthless crying out to the God that loves us and Piper goes on to say we prefer over all we treasure we receive we trust 
And that's what it means to be worthy of the Lord. But nobody answered the angel's challenge. And John wept. Why did John weep? He wept because he was there. He'd seen God. And he wanted to know more. He, he, he was hungry to know more. Like we need to be hungry to know more. And he wept because he thought that would be denied him. And when we study and meditate on God's word and treasure after treasure is revealed, we want to know more, don't we? Studying is not a chore. It's something we should do and it's something we should want to do. To understand more. To live our lives better to Christ Jesus. And as it happens, as with John, sometimes in our lives someone speaks to us. Do not weep. And he beheld the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. But, but it, it wasn't a lion that appeared, but a lamb. I paused in my uh, reading, when I was reading this, and I just meditated and, and I, you know, if we picture a spotless white lamb, innocent without blemish, without sin, this pure creature that took my horrendous sins to that cross that took everyone's so that we could be free to love him and free to worship him and free to praise him and free to have him each and every day in our lives he appeared as a lamb to satisfy the justice of God he came with the marks of being slain to show how he interceded for us in heaven and he continues to do so each and every day he intercedes with us with the Father each and every day he does come as the Lion of Judah that is to defeat Satan to end his reign once and for all so Christ took that scroll from God. But not by fraud. Not by violence. But by his merit and by his worthiness. By his worthiness, he took that scroll from the Father. Because he wanted to do the Father's will. The father delighted in his son to do this. Church, we must never take things by force, by fraud, by violence, by deceit. We must be worthy. Then God will see to all our needs. And he tells us that. And then as we see the four living creatures and the elders fall down before the Lamb, they begin their praise and their worship, a profound adoration of prayers and worship. Profound. And they sang a new song. Church, where is our new song today? We need to start singing a new song today as the time closes in on us. We need to sing a new song in our lives. More of Jesus in our lives. We may well acknowledge that saying, but we need to put it into practice. I'm going to quote Charles Spurgeon again. When he asked what his creed was, now creed is defined as a set of beliefs or aims which guide someone's actions. He simply said, Jesus Christ 
That was his creed, his life, his belief. That needs to be our life, our belief, my belief. Just going to, let's, just let's read verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Redeemed to God. Me, you, us. Everyone redeemed, redeemed to God. Not to Jesus, but redeemed to his Father. Redeemed from sin. Redeemed from Satan. The shackles of sin and bondage were broken. We were set at liberty to worship him fully with all our hearts. There's no need to wait anymore. We need to sing that new song. And, uh, and us made us kings and priests. Every ransom slave is not immediately promoted to honor. When they, we were baptized, we think it's a great favor to be restored to liberty, free of the chains of sin. The elect of God were made slaves to sin and to Satan. In every nation in the world, and Christ purchased liberty for everyone, every nation in the world, not just those in England, not just the white people, the black people, the brown people, every nation, tribe, and tongue. Because it tells us, for he so loved the world. Not parts of it. Not select groups. For he so loved the world. We shall reign with him on the earth. Kings and priests to rule over our own spirits. A priest to offer our own spiritual sacrifices. We will reign with him on the earth and judge on that great day. And that great day is coming fast upon us. It really, really is. And what more can we ask for? There is nothing more we can ask for than to be children of God, to be kings and priests in his kingdom. The time for polite preaching has run its course. Now is the time to bring the word of God as the truth which it is. And Jesus tells us in John 8, 31, 32, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth is here. Freedom is here. And the choice is ours, and ours alone. Amen.